Okay, I think it's a good time to be presenting the next talk. So, hello everyone, welcome to Phosphor G 2021. This is uh, it's Wednesday and this is the Aconcagua storm. Next, uh, Julia Duck will be presenting forecasting the future of weather data with goals R and tile DB. I'm sorry if I didn't get the goals R right. Uh, so, it's okay, okay. So, is that yours? Uh, will you share to add to the screen or? Sí. Okay. Then, is that yours? All right. So, uh, thank you everyone for coming to my talk today. Um, there's a couple things that I hope you get out of this talk. If nothing else, I want you to just be aware of the GOSAR satellite series and it's publicly available data. You can get it off of Google Cloud, off of AWS, and it's a lot of fun to play around with. I also hope you can get a basic understanding of what TileDB embedded is and uh, a basic understanding of how to use NetCDF-like data in TileDB. I'll get into a little bit more later about what I mean by NetCDF-like data. Um, I want to introduce you to the TileDB CF Pi library and its functionality. And I'm going to give you a concrete example of uh, storing that CF like data in TileDB using the GOSAR data. All right, so first off, what is TileDB? TileDB Embedded is an open source universal storage engine written in C. It stores data in arrays with support for both dense and sparse arrays, and it implements very fast array slicing across dimensions. So just to get into this a little bit, um, with the dense array, you have dimensions that you can define your array over. So this could be one to many different dimensions, which you do contain inside a domain. Use that domain to define an array. And the array can contain multiple attributes so that you could have different uh, integer values or character values or floating point values that you store in an attribute inside this array. And then it also supports metadata. On the sparse side of things, it's very similar. The difference being that instead of actualizing the entire array, you store just cells, and then it will also store the coordinate values for those cells. So for example, in this case here, you store the values of the attributes at that cell, but also the two and the four. And again, you have the array metadata, multiple possible attribute types. And in the sparse case, you also have the potential for multiplicity. So this can be turned on or off. Sometimes you want to be able to have a cell that stores multiple different values at that single cell, and sometimes you want each cell to have a unique value. So uh, kind of at a glance, why TileDB? There's a couple of things here I'd like to highlight. So it's built in C++, but we have APIs for a lot of different languages. Again, all open source. Some that might be of particular interest to this community is we have a Python API and an R API. Um, you have these R trees for sparse arrays, which gives you very fast sparse lookup. And a lot of time in the geospatial database, you can have good sparse support or good dense support. It's rare that you can store both of those uh, different kinds of data together in a single place. And that's one of the really powerful things about TileDB. And then um, we have immutable writes that are lock free, they're parallel, and they allow something called time traveling. And I'm going to dig into this a little bit because I feel like it gives you a good understanding of kind of what's going on underneath the hood. So when you write to TileDB, what it's going to do is create a fragment. So at each write, this right here, so you're writing at one timestamp, it creates a fragment, it stores that timestamp, and then you write again at another timestamp, it will then store this data to a fragment at a new timestamp. Then when you go to read the data, we'll take the fragment, we'll find which fragments have the most recent data and we'll just bring you back that most recent slice. But you can actually um, query just specific ranges of timestamps. So in this case, say I just wanted to read from that first fragment, I can do that. Um, if I read from the entire fragments that I have written here, it returns the most recent values. Or I can just look at that last timestamp alone and it will return back only the values from that timestamp with just fill values for the unwritten variables. It's pretty similar in the sparse case. The main difference is when you do allow duplicates. So if you don't allow duplicates, it's the same sort of idea. 
you have the data from that first timestamp written in a single fragment that you can query. If you read everything, those values from the second timestamp will erase that empty cell there and overwrite the value of four with 40, or you can get just that last fragment. In the uh, case where you do allow duplicates, the only difference is instead of overwriting the four with 40, both of those are valid values, so you get both of those back. All right, so let's dig into a little bit about NetCDF and TileDB and what does it mean to use a NetCDF data model in TileDB. So uh, this right here is a NetCDF data model in a kind of UML-ish format. This is from uh, the Unidata website. Um, the way that NetCDF works is it's a file format. And in each file, you can have multiple groups. And in a group, you define dimensions, which is a name and a length or size. You can also have metadata, which they call attributes. And you have variables, which is multidimensional arrays. And so right now, you can already see that this is going to fit well with TileDB, because both these fundamentally are looking at arrays. We're here on the TileDB side. We store things a little bit differently, but you still have these multidimensional arrays here in your attributes. You have your arrays that are defined on dimensions, and you have the simple key value metadata. And so when you're mapping the NetCDF data model to TileDB, what you want to do is you want to just map your groups to a group. You map the attributes, the metadata, and the NetCDF side to metadata and TileDB. A little unfortunate that we call attribute different things. Um, the dimensions go to dimensions, that's pretty straightforward. And then the variables go to attributes. Um, I should note too that if you want to, you can move away from the NetCDF data model. If you're mapping NetCDF into TileDB and you had sparse data that you were compressing somehow in the NetCDF data model, you can actually, for example, map your variable straight to a dimension and represent that sparse data more directly. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. Another thing I want to mention here is NetCDF is more of a file format. They have a data model, model that goes along with that format, but the file is inherently part of the data model. Whereas in TileDB, it's a storage engine. So it handles the file management for you but the file isn't an inherent part about how you think about the data, which is a lot easier when you're handling large data on the cloud where file management is actually very painful. You don't wanna necessarily be doing that manually. All right, so there's some special things in NetCDF that I wanna to touch on before we move on to the next bit. One is coordinates. Uh, there's a convention in NetCDF files that you name a dimension and a variable the same name, and you use that to signify that these arrays, these variables in NetCDF that are defined by this dimension, you can map the, uh, the value directly to it. So for example, maybe you have a time value where these are times and seconds from some fixed time, and you have your indices for that, uh, that uh, value. When you map that to TileDB, you can keep it directly in the NetCDF-like way, where you map that NetCDF dimension directly to a TileDB dimension. And you take that data and you match it to a TileDB attribute. And so this is the, the most straightforward thing to do. But you actually have other options. So another thing that you could do is you take that uh, NetCDF dimension and you still map it to a TileDB dimension. But you also add in another sparse array to your TileDB group that matches the data to a dimension and the index to an attribute. This allows you to do that quick uh, sparse lookup with the R trees. They'll allow you to then query the other data that you have stored that's defined on that variable. And then the third option is just to move completely away from the NetCDF uh, data model and just drop the index altogether and go straight from the data to the dimension. Another thing you'll see in NetCDF is unlimited dimensions. So this is something that we can also easily store in TileDB. 
uh, your first option is you just use a large domain for the dimension. When you're defining dimensions in TileDB before you write anything to an array, you define the type of the dimension, the name of the dimension, and the domain that it's valid on. And you can make that domain as large as your data type stores. So if you're storing with uh, unsigned 64-bit integers, you can make that the entire possible range of unsigned 64 integers. If you do that in a dense array, make sure that you use any compression filter and you'll have a whole bunch of fill values, the same value, they compress very nicely, so that's not an issue. But if you don't add in some sort of compression, you're gonna have some issues there. Um, the other option is sometimes you just wanna take the current data in the NetCDF file, you can do that too. Maybe the data was being processed and they didn't know how large things would be when they were first writing it, but now you know and you can just map that size directly to the domain in that case. All right, so next I wanna move on to uh, this library that we have to help with climate and forecast data um, that's written in Python. So this is uh, just adding some different functionality in to help with either getting data from something like NetCDF into TileDB or to accessing something that kept that NetCDF data model when you moved it to TileDB. So it has a couple of different things in it. One is additional support for accessing TileDB arrays from groups. Uh, NetCDF depends a lot on groups. This can be very convenient uh, just to, to make it a little bit more similar to a workflow you're used to. Um, we also have an engine for ingesting NetCDF data into TileDB using NetCDF 4 as the reader for NetCDF. And we have a TileDB back engine, excuse me, back end engine for X-Ray. So currently this engine only supports arrays, but we're working on group support. Um, we do accept feature requests and PRs. Uh, this is on GitHub. You can go ahead and check it out directly. All open source. Um, happy to answer questions about it at any time. So uh, um, about doing the actual ingestion step. So when you convert to NetCDF to TileDB using our converter engine, you follow a couple of different steps. First is you define a conversion recipe. So you can either do this manually or you can auto-generate from a NetCDF group. Once you do the auto-generation, you still have the opportunity to go in and manually change things. Maybe you want to change the names of variables as you're mapping them to attributes, or you want to change the names of arrays, or you want to add additional compression filters. You can do that before you do the actual conversion. Next is you create a TileDB group or array schema. And then finally, you copy your data from your NetCDF file or files into TileDB arrays. This can all be done at once, but I find generally when you know your data, it's useful to spend some time modifying things and just taking the opportunity whenever you're converting from one storage system to another to refine how you're storing things, think about if you have the best possible representation and just clean things up a little bit. All right, and then sometimes when you're adjusting NetCDF data, you wanna do things a little bit more manually. So I don't wanna make people feel like this is your only option to get your data into TileDB. So maybe you want to process and analyze your data first. You don't want to go straight from NetCDF to TileDB. You want to do some analysis. You want to create some other sort of product, and you want to put that into TileDB. That's always an option. Or maybe there's a feature you want for your conversion that's not yet implemented in TileDB CFPy. So we haven't really gotten too far into handling uh, metadata yet. And so maybe you need to do something special with your NetCDF metadata and uh, you want to dig into that more manually. Or maybe you want to use a programming language other than Python. You're just not a Python programmer. So you have some options here. You can create a bespoke converter in any language that uses both TileDB and NetCDF. So C, C++, Java, Python are both supported. Or maybe you want to convert your data directly into TileDB first and then do your process and analysis after conversion, you can do that too. In the TileDB CFPy, if you're just directly converting to NetCDF without any modification, it is very fast, and you don't have to do any of that manual tweaking that I was mentioning. All right, now for the fun part, let's get into the GOSAR. So, one second. So the GOSAR satellite series, is a four satellite program. 
There's two operational satellites at a time. One is Ghost East, which has uh, ongoing imagery of the North and South America, of the Atlantic Ocean, and a little bit of the West Coast of Africa. And then you have Ghost West, which is North America, the Western part of North America, and the Pacific Ocean. Um, it has a bunch of different devices on it. These two right here are what I'm going to be focusing on. Um, these are taking Earth imagery. You also have some imagery of the sun from these two sensors, and then some in situ uh, now, uh, data as well that's just from uh, where the satellite is located. So let's look at the Radiance 1B data. This is a uh, kind of imagery you might expect to see. This is the full disk representation. So this is defined on a fixed grid from the satellite's perspective with the dimensions of Y and X. It has one file saved for each band and each scan time. The scan times have changed a little bit over the uh, lifetime of the GOSAR satellite series. And so right now, I believe they're doing a full disk scan every 10 minutes. And they do them for each band, and there's 12 different bands or channels. And so there's a couple of different ways you can store this in TileDB. Uh, one that I thought was particularly useful is you combine the files by adding dimensions for the band and time index. And then you add that access label that I was talking about earlier, the maps from the scan midpoint timestamp, or maybe you want to map from the beginning of the scan or the end of the scan to uh, that time index. And this allows you to do some really nice scoring of the data that doesn't require a lot of manually trying to figure out exactly which files you need from a S3 bucket. So this is what that might look like. You define what timestamps you want to get the region over. So in this example here, this would be pulling just the data from uh, that uh, early morning timestamp. So I said is there's about one every 10 minutes right now. Um, and what you do is you can specify which data you want out of the TileDB group, either by the array name or by the attribute name. And then you just go ahead and you query the time index from your uh, first array and put that directly into your next array to get out your final radiance values. And so anyone who's actually gone in with the GOSAR data should know how painful it is to find the files you want from that original NetCDF data. Because as I mentioned before, uh, these are saving lots of files in each band. And it uses a complex directory system to, to map them. So it will be the product name from the ghost R, and then the year. And then you have the day in the year where it's not you know, month day. It's actually you know, like 265 or something like that that you need to calculate. And then the hour in the day. And then there's a bunch of files with complicated names in that folder. And you have to dig that in versus here where I want to know, well, I just want this band here. I don't need to do any special processing. I let TileDB handle that for me. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is the GLM data set. So this is a slightly different data set. In the Radiance case, it's very clearly a dense array. But this lightning data, on the other hand, is definitely something that's sparse. So the way it's stored in NetCDF, which really only handles dense data, is it just has an ongoing list of events, groups, and flashes, where um, here, an event is just a light that was detected from one of the sensors on the GLM device. Uh, group is a, all of the events that are next to each other at a particular timestamp. And a flash is all of the groups that were together at subsequent timestamps. And so they use that to build up this lightning data. And then there's mappings from the events to the groups and the groups to the flash, which use IDs local to the file. This um, data is created every 20 seconds with data from overlapping time spans. So maybe the lightning flash you want to look at was from the previous 20 seconds, but it's in the next 20 second bucket, depending on how fast the processing happens. This means there's 180 files per hour. That's a lot of files to try and handle. So one possible way to represent this in TileDB is you convert that index dimension, so event 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, into the latitude, longitude, and time dimensions for the event. You then can replace the mapping from the latitude and longitude and time coordinates, uh, or to the, sorry, you replace the ID mapping instead of going from event whatever to group whatever. You can just do directly 
horizontal latitude, longitude, and time. And you can use this to create a single array for the TileDB events, a single array for the groups, and a single array for the flashes. And in this case, rather than having to have 180 different files per hour, you're just always adding to these same TileDB arrays where you have the sparse representation and sparse arrays that your data really supports. And then just kind of uh, tying these two together, suppose I wanted to grab uh, that full disk uh, image I had before, and I want all of the lightning events that happened during the time span of that scan. Really easy to do. I just grab the time bounds uh, attribute that I stored previously and say maybe I want event energy, and I can really quickly just go ahead and query that out. So kind of bring this all back together, um, looking at, again, this NetCDF data model, uh, it's uh, this fundamental part here can be really handy, the handy <laughs> for storing dense data. And you can map that directly into TileDB. Sometimes maybe you fit your data into NetCDF because it was the tool you had available for you at the time. And you can take that and generalize it further. And then one of the real powerful things here is that you get to move away from this file system. You let the data engine handle the files for you, and you get directly into just using arrays and accessing directly the data that you want with all of the fast querying power of TileDB. All right. Um, I think I wrapped up a little bit early, so we have uh, time for questions now. Okay, that was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. So let's go forward with questions. Mm. So first one is this one. Is it possible to publish TileDB data on a dashboard or mapper or mapper? Um, I'm sorry, what was that? Sorry, I uh, will repeat. Is it possible to publish TileDB data on a dashboard or a mapper? Yes, yeah, so um, TileDB is a company, and we have a uh, TileDB cloud that has a lot of built-in ways to set up uh, dashboards with our cloud product. But the core engine is all open source, so if you want to set it up yourself, we have uh, REST APIs that you can set up. You can access it in maybe using Go, make it easy to set up your backend. We have um, a lot of different interfaces to help make that easier. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, is TileDB very different from SRI and FAR? From, from which? I think I will copy it because I'm not sure how this is pronounced. Oh, uh, X-ray and ZAR. So TileDB is fairly different from ZAR. Where they're similar is they're both array-based cloud native storage systems. Um, I haven't spent a whole lot of time playing with Czar, so if anyone's a Czar expert, they can uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. But um, right now with Czar, uh, the functionality is more based on just the, the dense arrays. Um, it doesn't have unlimited dimensions. It doesn't have the time traveling. Um, and it doesn't have any of the sparse support. So if you want all of that extra functionality, TileDB is uh, going to allow you to do that. On the other hand, because ZAR doesn't have all this uh, extra functionality, it's a lot simpler to get up and running. Um, with X-Ray and ZAR, ZAR is pretty closely integrated to X-Ray. I think there's a lot of overlapping developers there. Um, but X-Ray supports a lot of different backends. X-Ray is an in-memory tool for anyone who's not familiar with it written in Python that uses the NetCDF data model. And so part of this work is creating the X-Ray backend. And so one of the nice things about X-Ray is it allows you to do the lazy loading of your data. And those coordinates I mentioned earlier, it will greedily load those into memory, but then leave all of your big arrays on disk and just load them as, as you actually do computations or plotting or whatever else you need. And so part of me, we have the X-Ray backend for TileDB, so you can do all of that with TileDB as well. I see. Thank you very much. And um, it seems like there are no more questions. So we can leave it here if it's okay. 
Okay, yeah, thank you for your time, everyone, and thanks for checking out my talk. Thank you for your talk, uh, Julia, and see you around in Phosphogy. Bye-bye.